Hello and welcome back to the CCSE Research Conference, Democracy and the Media. Um, we are getting ready to go into our next session, but I'd like to remind everybody to um, please leave your cameras on so we can make this an audience interactive session as much as possible. It's a lot more fun when the presenters can see the audience members and you can see them. So the next panel we have up explores gender, media, and communication. As more women find careers in journalism, we see increased research into gendered norms and gendered language. This panel looks into how people are perceived when they use language considered to be masculine or feminine and analyzes politicians' rhetoric and the personal accounts of women journalists to gain insights into perceptions of gender in news media and messaging in politics. Moderating today's panel is Carly Schmidt, Associate Professor in the Department of Political Science at Indiana State University. Dr. Schmidt, a CCSE Research Conference veteran, is a political, sorry, is a earned her PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 2013. Her research interests center on Congress and political polarization, and her current projects include the exploration of state-level changes in voter access and after the 2020 election and all, and all local responses to gubernatorial pandemic orders. Welcome, Carly Schmidt. Thank you, Andrea, for the kind introduction. And thank you, Andrea, Robert, and the whole team, the folks that work behind the scenes to make this conference happen. Um, it's not the easiest time to be doing a conference, but you've done it, it's gone on with, without a hitch. So, so thank you <laughs> and, and good job. Um, we have two papers that we'll be uh, looking at today and uh, seeing the presentations on. And I have to say, it was these were great papers. They actually go really well together. Um, both of these papers look at how, like Andrea said, about gender roles. Um, but I think that they also really kind of hone in on the ways that women do their jobs and how they their expectations of how how they see themselves doing their jobs and what their jobs look like. Um, whether it be the newsroom, out in the field, on the campaign trail, or on the floor of the U.S. House. Um, so I'm really excited uh, to, to see these presentations. So I'm going to first introduce our first paper. Uh, we have uh, Jared McDonald and Zachary Scott. Both are recent graduates of the University of Maryland. Dr. McDonald is a postdoctoral scholar with the Political Psychology Research Group at Stanford University. His research lies at the intersection of electoral accountability and political psychology, with several projects underway that examine the ways citizens develop perceptions of character traits of political elites and how these perceptions inform political behavior. Dr. Scott is a visiting assistant professor of political science and international affairs at Wake Forest University. His research focuses on political communication, mass media, presidential primary campaigns, political rhetoric, and political parties. And he has a number of ongoing projects that explore these topics. Both Dr. McDonald and Dr. Scott, ha Dr. Scott have an impressive record of publications. And I am going to turn it over to them now. Thank you so much, uh, Carly. Thank you to everyone for, for being here. Um, a special thank you, obviously, to, to Robert and Andrea for organizing this and inviting us. Uh, it's been a really wonderful experience. I'm going to see if I can share my screen and do it correctly uh, with the audio. That's, you know, always a... That seems strange. It's not giving me an option to... One second. Let me see if I can... It should be on the bottom of the screen when you share. No, it is. It's just when I click share screen, it doesn't even offer me the, maybe I need to close other windows. Um, okay, close now. Um, just not giving me an option to share the actual, there we go. All right. So let's see if I do this. Can everyone see, are you still getting the, the full screen? Um, awesome. Okay, so um, this is a, a project that really nicely fits kind of at the intersection of mine, uh, my interest in Zach's, um, where I look primarily at the masses and Zach looks a lot at uh, institutions, um, the, the, the mass media and uh, the rhetoric of uh, political leaders. Um, we entitled it Strong Men Caring Women, How Gender Shapes Emotional Political Rhetoric, though as you'll see, we could have easily named it how gender and partisanship 
shapes emotional political rhetoric since we find strong evidence of both. But I just want to start with kind of the, the main motivation where, where we were coming from uh, when we did when we started this project, which uh, starts with kind of the literature uh, in gender and politics that finds that uh, women are running for and winning office at record rates. Uh, and often studies end up not really finding evidence that women fare worse than men. Uh, yet the success of some women may be obscuring uh, important biases that still exist, that while women may win at rates equal to men, uh, those women tend to be far more qualified for the positions they hold than their male counterparts. Uh, so we, we do find strong evidence in this literature uh, that there are important barriers to women's success in the political arena, and that these barriers are largely attributable to negative gender stereotypes. Uh, that traits seen as valuable for leadership are often perceived or imbued with some sort of masculine quality. Uh, so women have historically only been allowed to enter into politics for a limited number of reasons uh, in their role as uh, mothers, nurturers, or educators. And so we believe that there's, um, you know, these stereotypes may influence uh, the kinds of ways women and men portray their personal characteristics publicly. Uh, but when we're talking about personal characteristics, we're really talking about candidate character and the way that voters uh, or citizens perceive uh, the, the, the character traits of candidates or politicians. Um, now, this is a, a contested literature. I think the, the dominant paradigm was one put forth by Don Kinder, who came up with a sort of four-part typology of candidate character, including competence, leadership, integrity, and empathy. Uh, but scholars have argued for as few of, as two dimensions of candidate character and as many as six. And what we found really useful for the purposes of our research uh, was this meta-trait framework proposed by social psychology. Not necessarily that there were only two traits overall, but that all of the traits being talked about uh, fit pretty neatly into one of the two meta-traits being agency and communion. Agency being things like assertiveness, decision-making, uh, intelligence, uh, which you could think of as comprising things like competence and leadership, um, whereas communion being more about compassion, friendliness, fair-mindedness, which would more easily comprise uh, things that we see like integrity and empathy in the, um, the kinder typology. Now, as you probably would expect, um, these meta traits have kind of a gendered connotation that women are perceived or, or assumed to excel on traits related to communion, whereas men are perceived to excel uh, on traits related to agency. Uh, again, this goes back to gender stereotypes. And while it might be easy to think, well, okay, women are automatically assumed to be better on one, men are automatically assumed to be better on the other. So it's kind of a wash. Uh, we don't really find that in the political realm that frequently uh, agentic traits are seen as especially valuable for political leadership roles. And so women caught in what's uh, referred to as the double bind, where there's this pressure to convey strong leadership uh, but in doing so, women are therefore perceived as being less feminine. Uh, so we think there's a good reason to suspect that women will uh, be, uh, there's this incentive to play to type. Uh, and we draw this from three different uh, theories in the social sciences. Uh, the first being expectancy violation theory, which argues that the public is more reactive to information that runs counter to their expectations. Expectations, as I mentioned, that are often informed by gender stereotypes of women as maternal or nurturing rather than strong leaders. Uh, role incongruity theory is similar, but it's slightly different. It suggests that, that some may view women as compassionate, just automatically compassionate, regardless of their qualities, uh, and therefore poor fits for certain types of leadership roles. So it's not that they're being penalized uh, per se for making claims about their leadership skills, but that sexist stereotypes are applied to women regardless of their uh, individual qualifications qualities. Uh, and then finally, implicit leadership theory posits that people mentally generate what's referred to as a prototype uh, of a leader, which is based in large part on real world examples of leaders. And since politics has been historically and still is uh, dominated by, by male politicians, um, the, the, the prototype that would come to mind for most people would still be that of a man. Now, while there's good evidence that uh, these meta traits are sort of owned by um, uh, uh, men or women, uh, there's also a good amount of evidence suggests that uh, Democrats and Republicans own these traits as well, that Democrats are perceived or assumed to excel on communal traits, whereas Republicans are perceived to excel on agentic traits. This is drawn from theories of issue ownership. Uh, Democrats are largely seen as the better party for handling issues related to 
healthcare or care for the poor, things that are more uh, viewed as uh, empathetic issues, whereas Republicans uh, are, are perceived as doing better on issues related to national defense, where, where there needs to be sort of a strong authoritative leader. Um, so due to the issues that the parties um, champion and the groups that they're perceived to represent, Democrats and Republicans similarly have this ownership of the two meta traits. Um, could there be the same incentive then for Democrats and Republicans to play to type? Uh, we think so. And you know, potentially there's just the, the same kind of mechanism as going on with gender. Uh, but we also consider the possibility that you know, Democrats and Republicans are often appealing to different electorates. In primaries, they're very explicitly appealing to different electorates. Uh, but even in a general election, uh, parties may, or, or partisan politicians may be playing more to their base than to the overall national electorate, and therefore may be appealing to uh, different groups of people that value different kinds of traits in a leader. So all of this leads us to kind of this overarching research question, which is, you know, do men, women, Democrats, Republicans use character-based appeals in their political rhetoric the way the literature and political behavior suggest that they should? Uh, essentially, what we're asking is whether politicians act in ways that suggest they're aware that these incentives exist and, and respond accordingly. Uh, and just to put it formally, what I've kind of stated in broader terms, we, we posit the, the gender constraints and the partisan constraints hypotheses, which just says that uh, women and democratic politicians uh, will use more kind of caring communal language in their rhetoric and less authority or agentic language than, uh, than men or Republicans in similar positions. Um, now, these do not strictly compete against one another, these two hypotheses, but we do also in, the, in, in our manuscript consider the possibility that once we account for partisanship, there will be less uh, uh, sort of room for gender to matter. Now, we also posit these, uh, I would say, more speculative hypotheses. They're not less important, um, but we don't have as strong of expectations about what we may find. Uh, but as I mentioned, you know, a lot of this is about whether politicians are responding to the incentives that the public puts, you know, the, the sort of constraints that the public is putting on them. Um, so we may expect to see differences being larger in situations where there were more eyeballs on them. Uh, so in very public or salient situations, the differences may be larger. And also in campaigning situations where politicians are appealing directly to voters, we may see larger differences if they believe that the public has particular expectations, things that they want to hear. Uh, getting into the data, uh, three of the four of our data sources uh, came from the, uh, came, were involved taking uh, text of transcripts from the C-SPAN video library. Um, and I'll just note that the sample size is vary quite a bit here. So in the context of governing, we uh, took uh, what we thought was uh, a governing situation, but a very salient one, which was House floor speeches uh, during the second impeachment of Donald Trump. Um, we also then looked at... Um, House floor speeches in a less salient situation um, in three days in March. Uh, if, if for those of you who are uh, tuned into Zach's presentation earlier, um, he mentioned that we we actually found out after sort of deciding on these three days that this involved some some issues that were explicitly gendered, uh, like uh, renewing the Violence Against Women Act. I believe there's also d debate over. Uh, suspending the deadline for the Equal Rights Amendment ratification. Um, so that was kind of a happy little uh, mistake where we can look at explicitly gendered uh, issues relative to non-gendered issues. Uh, in the context of campaigning, we use this uh, awesome massive data set that, that Zach has put together over a long period of time um, that involves uh, presidential primary campaign speeches um, all the way back from 2000 up to 2020. Uh, and then we also wanted to have one sort of non-C-SPAN source just so we could have a check to see, well, maybe politicians are acting differently because they're responding to the C-SPAN cameras. So we look at fundraising emails by members of Congress from 2010 to 2020. Um, and I'll just note that, yeah, the, the, the sample size is very dramatically. So for when I get to the results, in large part, I focus on the substantive effects rather than always focusing on what's statistically significant. But again, that's just because in some of the floor speeches, we're dealing with relatively small samples. Um, now, for the two governing corpora, uh, this just involved locating um, the appropriate videos and retrieving the closed captioning contents. That was the, the same was true for the presidential uh, primary speeches. And then uh, the fundraising emails uh, come from the uh, data source that's uh, the DC inbox. And I just want to give you uh, an idea for the types of speeches that we were pulling. This one's from Sylvia Garcia, uh, 
uh, speaking on the House floor during the impeachment proceedings. Let's see if I can get this to work. Abundantly clear that this president has threatened our democratic system, has interfered with the peaceful transition of power, and has endangered an equal branch of government. The President of the United States is unhinged, unfit, and unstable. Or as we say in my district, está loco el hombre. To the point where he's willing to tear our democracy down unless he prevails in his quest to overturn the election that he clearly lost. Yes, this is just a clip I like. It's got some character and it also shows what sort of a uh, uh, foreshadows what we're going to find, which is that the the um, uh, impeachment proceedings were a rather unique situation. Um, and so we find results that don't always necessarily fit with everything else. But, um, so in terms of the analysis, uh, we use uh, and, and Zach uh, went into far more detail than I will. Uh, and he also knows way more about it than I do. So um, definitely going to, you know, make him answer those questions. Uh, but we're we're, we're using the Moral Foundations Dictionaries, which really captures two moral dimensions that correspond to traits men uh, and women or Democrats and Republicans own. This is the authority respect dimension, which we think uh, corresponds to agentic traits like strong leadership and the care or harm dimension that corresponds to communal traits like empathy. Uh, and it's not just that we're saying that this is how um, that, that these traits correspond to these things. Uh, there is a literature of Scott Clifford and others have done research showing that moral foundations theory really nicely encapsulates um, the dimensions of candidate character that voters perceive. Uh, and the outcome that we're looking at is just the percentage of words in each uh, speech that are identified in correspondence with each dimension. So that's the dependent variable. Um, the way we uh, actually test uh, the hypotheses, we're running good old linear regression uh, the dependent variable being just the measures of authority and caring language in each text. Um, our independent variables that we care about, the, the main ones of interest, are the speaker's gender and party. Uh, we also wanted to make sure we included some sort of control for seniority, that if men were overrepresented in seniority, they might be using more authoritative language, uh, and that could be a, an important confounding factor. Uh, so uh, with, with the floor speeches, we use member of Congress seniority. Um, in the presidential primary speech corpus, uh, we use the number of years of political experience that that politician had. Uh, and then the DC inbox corpus, we have a number of measures, including uh, just the member of Congress seniority, whether they were in the majority, um, uh, whether which chamber, whether it was House or Senate, and then whether they were in party leadership. Uh, we also have to account for non-independence, right? So with linear regression, we're assuming that all of our observations are independent of one another, which is not always true when you're using textual data. Uh, with the floor speeches, there was nothing that we really had to do because uh, each member really only spoke once. Uh, so what you didn't have uh, the same person coming to the floor multiple times. With primary campaign speeches, you do, right? So you have uh, people who make a number of different speeches. And also, we want to consider the fact that, you know, candidates speaking in 2000 may be similar to each other in important ways. Uh, and different from candidates in 2004 or 2008. So we use uh, campaign level fixed effects and then we cluster our standard errors around the candidate uh, to account for this non-independence. Uh, we do something similar with the DC inbox where we use Congress um, level fixed effects, which, which you know, addition of Congress this was, uh, and uh, uh, member, we cluster our standard errors around the member of Congress. So getting into the results, um, these uh, figures, figure 1A and 1B, uh, display the coefficients for the gender variable here. So this is the estimated effect of being a woman rather than a man um, on first caring rhetoric and then authority rhetoric. And we see uh, on caring, all the coefficients go in the hypothesized direction. They're not all statistically significant. Like three of the four are either significant or marginally significant. Um, and we also noticed that the, the March 17th to 19th, um, that, that second bar, the light blue, uh, is especially strong, even though there's a good amount of uncertainty around that uh, particular estimate. Um, with authority, the results are less consistent. There's really little evidence of any kind of effect of gender. And to the extent that there is a difference, it's more for the uh, impeachment proceedings. And uh, we find that women are actually using more, not less authority language. So just to wrap up what those figures show, we find reasonably strong support for, for the hypothesis, uh, the gender constraints hypothesis in the context of caring. 
that again, all these coefficients go in a positive uh, and expected direction with uh, estimates being especially strong um, during that March 17th to 19th floor debate when there were more gender issues being discussed. Uh, but we find little evidence uh, for, for the gender constraints hypothesis in the context of authority. All of the effects were null, and the only substantively large difference was positive, whereas the hypothesis suggested that we would actually uh, see women using less authoritative language. Uh, moving into the results uh, for the partisan constraints hypothesis. So again, this is the, the similar figure. The figure displays the coefficients for the Republican variable. So that is the, the estimated effect of, being, of the politician being a Republican rather than a Democrat. And on caring, we find all the coefficients are, are significant and going in the hypothesized direction that Republicans use uh, a lot less caring rhetoric uh, in, the, in across all four corpora, but especially in the two governing corpora, um, those top two bars. Um, on authority, we find uh, the hypothesized effect in three of the four corpora. As you can see those, those bottom three with Republicans using more authority language in the March 17th to 19th, um, floor speeches, uh, in the primary speeches, and in the DC inbox. The huge exception, however, uh, is on the impeachment trial, where we actually see Republicans using far less authoritative language uh, than Democrats. So what we're finding here is, again, strong support now, uh, let's say even stronger support for the partisan constraints hypothesis than the, than the gender constraints hypothesis um, for Republicans uh, in the context of caring. Um, again, Republicans are using less uh, caring language but there's some variation um, with especially large effects, um, uh, big differences between Republicans and Democrats in the context of governing. And we also find fairly strong support for the hypothesis in the context of authority. Again, across three of the four corpora, we find this result, but Republicans use far less authority language in the context of the impeachment proceedings. Our conclusion is context seems to matter at least somewhat. Right, it's it's not all the, uh, it, it, maybe not always what we think, but certainly uh, at least in the context of the impeachment proceedings, we we saw Democrats and Republicans reacting to an external stimulus here. Uh, that Democrats were uh, exceedingly angry uh, over the insurrection and uh, the invasion of the Capitol, and were using a lot more authoritative language than Republicans. So again, context mattering, but not necessarily in the ways that we had hypothesized. So we also wanted to consider the possibility that not only do gender and party shape presentations of, of candidate character, but that they may interact. So uh, these plots that I'm going to show in the next two slides uh, show the interaction of gender and partisanship uh, with regard to the caring rhetoric. So this is um, all these coefficients represent um, the, the essentially the differences between men and women. Um, this is the women uh, uh, indicator variable here, but we separate them out by Democrat or Republican. Um, and across the top here, what we find actually is that at least with regard to caring, when we saw significant results um, that, that women were using more caring language. This was driven largely by Republicans, uh, Republican women using more caring language than Republican men. Um, but that the differences weren't really pronounced um, in the context of campaigning, uh, that both Repu that Republican uh, women and Democratic women were both um, using uh, somewhat, I guess, more caring language, although the differences weren't huge. Um, on authority, uh, we, we do the same sort of uh, uh, analysis. And here we find, again, limited evidence of any kind of interaction. Uh, Republican women um, are less likely to use authority language than Republican men in the context of governing. Um, but the differences are less pronounced in the context of campaigning, which we show here at the bottom. So our conclusions here is that the gender differences on caring are driven primarily by Republican women. Um, this was something that we actually uh, were, were talking about in one of the um, earlier uh, presentations that I believe uh, Jacob mentioned uh, that you know Democrats use a lot more caring language than than Republicans do, and perhaps there's some sort of ceiling effect that that Democratic men are using a lot of caring language, and so Democratic women may also be using a lot of caring language, but there's just not much room for them to go up. Um, that Republican women in this situation are perhaps more cross pressured. Uh, that that yes, they kind of feel like they maybe need to use more authoritative language uh, because they're Republicans, but also uh, due to their gender, need to uh, emphasize uh, the, the the trait of compassion. Um, 
Uh, and that gender differences on authority remain smaller here, uh, not often significant. Um, Republican women did, however, we note, uh, use less authority language uh, in the March 17th to 19th data set, which led us to think, okay, well, maybe we're dealing with small sample size here, but let's look at the gendered versus non-gendered topics within the March 17th to 19th data set. And what we found here, interestingly enough, was actually not a whole lot was going on. Um, that, 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 you know, in, in this, th this, is, this is looking at uh, the effect of politician gender on caring at the top or authority rhetoric. And we find that it didn't really matter whether it was a gendered or non-gendered topic, the effects were roughly consistent uh, across, across both. Now, we, sometimes you, know, you, you do find that there are somewhat positive effects, but still it doesn't seem to matter what the context is here, whether it's a gendered or non-gendered issue. Uh, the more interesting results come up uh, in the context of the use of authority language. Um, especially here at the, the, the bottom of the slide here. Uh, on authority, we're finding that evidence that Republicans uh, will actually use more authority language, but only when it is a non-gendered topic. That when it is a gendered topic, they'll actually use uh, less authority language, which suggests they may be responding to the, the, the specific issues that are being discussed. So just to uh, tie things up into a nice bow, hopefully, um, we find that gender differences emerge, but it's less. Con but these differences are less consistent than the partisan differences that we find. Uh, gender seems to be especially important on uh, the volume of caring language, but less influential in the use of authority language. And this is something that Zach and I have found in our other research. I think when we first started this, we thought uh, that this, these were sort of two sides of the same coin. That if you're going to be using a lot of caring language, you're going to be using less authority language, and vice versa. But that's not what we find here. You, you, the, the, there can be effects on um, the use of caring language uh, with, with little or no effect on the use of authority language. Um, does context matter? We, we provide a conditional yes, um, but it's not always easily predictable how context will matter. Politicians appear to respond to the incentives, especially when you looked at the, uh, the, the impeachment floor proceedings, you saw much different results than in the other contexts. Um, we found really modest differences on the most salient campaigning settings. So this was, I, I, I went into this thinking we were gonna find the biggest effects uh, in the uh, corpus looking at uh, presidential primary speeches, that these were very public events uh, with frequently national political figures uh, and that they would be especially sensitive to the kind of pressures and what the voters would want. But we actually don't see bigger differences in this setting, which suggests that maybe the context doesn't matter in every case, the way we think it might. Um, and that, in fact, we find the biggest differences during uh, impeachment, which was a salient governing setting. Um, so I'll just wrap up by saying that the differences that we find on gender combined with all the literature that exists on backlash effects suggests that there are important restrictions on the types of language that women may be able to use in politics and potentially as well the policies that they can champion, which could have negative effects on kind of the overall health of, of democratic governance and, and representation overall. And with that, I'll just say thank you. And we look forward to uh, any questions that you may have. We have about uh, nine minutes for questions. Nine or 10 minutes. Anyone? Well, I had a question. Um, I was wondering if, how you would respond to this. Um, and you can't get it when you look at, you can't get at it when you look at floor speeches, but I'm wondering if maybe your differences between Republican men and women might be a function in terms of what you find with the house data uh, of, of what Republican men are doing. So, and you can get at this by maybe looking at your DC inbox, which has a longitudinal assessment mm -hmm. rather than the two cross sections where you can see, I wonder if there's been a Trump effect, right? With this bravado and um, aggressive language, like what we've seen in other presentations. I'm wondering if Republican men might be responding to that and upping their, their the way that they speak, right? To correspond to their leader where Republican women maybe aren't adapting their language. And I know you, you don't have time to go back through the archive and get at that with floor speeches or, I, but I wonder if you can tap into that. You would have a larger in with the DC inbox. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very interesting, right? This is a very uh, interesting empirical question because I can also see the possibility that the women are responding in the same way um, that we see um, 
uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene and, and politicians like that um, reacting real Trumpy. Um, uh, and and that, granted, there's also this replacement, right? That uh, politicians from the early 2000s maybe aren't still in Congress. Um, but it would be interesting to see if there is sort of this interaction of Trump rhetoric with um, uptake, right? That the, 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 the uptake is different for men than women um, in, in office. I, I, I don't know what I would necessarily find, but that is something we could look at. Yeah, I'll just tack on briefly to that because that, that's a really interesting question. I have not looked at that and I really should have looked at that. And I will look at that. Um, my immediate reaction was to think about like, well, George W. Bush was like a cowboy who like went like to his ranch and was like all manly and cut down brush and like Ronald Reagan, this like Western movie actor. And then like George H.W. Bush is like critiqued for being a wussy and stuff like that. Like this sort of masculine thing, it runs in that party, I think, longer. But then again, you do have like candidates for Senate body slamming reporters. And that seems to be a qualitative difference in sort of machismo. And so they're like, I, I can see how it could happen both ways. They're like, no, this has been a consistent through line, but also maybe there has been an actual noticeable uptick in the past couple of years that we should really take a look at because that's a really great point. I have just a quick clarifying question. So um, we know that standard errors for fixed effects models are often larger inflated um, than random effects, especially when like the predictor variable varies little across time as gender, I think gender probably doesn't. Um, you said you clustered your standard errors around, I missed it, was it Congress? What, what did you cluster them around? The, the clustering was done around the speaker essentially. The down, um, okay, the, gotcha. Like the, the candidate or the member of Congress. Gotcha, and you said that each one only gave like one speech pretty much? For the floor speeches, floor yeah, speech. because we're dealing with a really narrow time frame. It was more when we're dealing with the DC inbox and uh, the presidential primary speeches where you have a lot of different speeches from the same speaker. Gotcha, thank you. Robert? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just curious about your two by two table. The, the differences are so big between the one side and the other. Why, why um, in your design did you limit yourself on the C-SPAN side, I guess? Um, I understand why the other data set that, that uh, Zach has in the DC inbox will give you large ends, but it's just such a contrast between the C-SPAN side. Is there any solution to that? Is it just too hard to get the data? Uh, it's not impossible. So like, I mean, the, my, my immediate answer is that I would look at the congressional record, that I would just pull the full text of that and use that. Although I don't know how easily I'd be able to merge that in with like speaker traits, like gender, probably pretty easily. Um, yeah, I, like, I, it certainly is a feasible work, something we could do. It would be a lot of like, it would take some elbow grease, but like yeah. it could be done. Like, yeah, I, I kind of think that these like three day windows and like, especially because we're so interested, not just in sort of governing, but governing by salience, that like the ability to pick something very specific, like the impeachment, which we know is such a flashbulb moment, that like, the more you try and delve into approaching this from a big data aspect, the more you're going to lose on that, the ability to grab onto something so like notable and important and really be able to dive into it. Um, or similarly with, you know, taking the, the March corpus and being able to split up, right, let's look at by topic, that as you kind of broaden out the scope, what you gain in sort of the amount of data you have to play with, you lose in your ability to like really know that data really, really well and do something really constructive and interesting with the details of it. So there's a trade-off there that I just think we were, we're, we're very happy with you know, the ability to take this smaller subset that we get really high confidence in and we think we know really well and we're able to analyze at a really high level. Yeah, I'll just uh, tag on, like, I think ideally, right? Like what we have essentially when we're looking at salience or campaigning right this is we have essentially four you know one one observation you know per cell in this you know two by two table so right so we're not, we're not necessarily able to throw a ton of statistical power at this you know if 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 uh resources were not uh at all an issue we would gather all of the you know the, the text from you know all sorts of different hearings and floor speeches and come up with some coding scheme on exactly how salient the situation was, but that would of course require us to come up with a very good coding scheme for how salient uh, 
a particular situation was so that we could look and say, okay, when it's a 0.3 on the zero to one salience, you know, we, we get these kinds of effects. When it's a 0.7, we get these, and we could, we could look at it in a more continuous uh, fashion. But I think there is just a, I know at least for, for me, uh, there's a, a pragmatic um, uh, aspect of it where we really wanted, as Zach said, to just focus, okay, no one's going to argue with us that the impeachment proceedings weren't an incredibly salient and also a governing uh, act. Um, and so we can see if we if we get I, I would say if we got bigger differences, I would really want to dig into sort of more, uh, you know, grades of difference. Um, but the fact that we're not getting huge differences across context tells me that maybe it's that. Yeah, context matters, but there's probably something kind of uh, intrinsic um, that the politicians who are in these positions uh, regardless of, of the situation are, are, are frequently using similar kinds of um, speech. Carly, I actually had a question. So um, I wonder, would you guys, do you think you would see a bigger variance in gender language over time if you were looking at people specifically like Nancy Pelosi or Nancy, uh, sorry, um, Lisa Murkowski, who've been in office, like looking at them at the beginning of their careers versus where they are now? I think probably. I, I think, I mean, I think this is certainly open to debate. I, I, certainly you're going to get huge swings when there's a big replacement of a bunch of different, you know, legislators from a previous era with new legislators. But I think just in terms of listening to uh, various politicians over time, it does seem like they have adapted to fit with uh, their kind of I don't want to say necessarily median voter, but you know, you, even you look at someone like Joe Biden, like he has changed over the years in the kinds of language that he uses because he knows he's still a representative of this coalition of people and that coalition is changing over time. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. It makes me think of the, the next paper we're going to uh, hear about in terms of like the gender socialization versus the job socialization, right? Getting right at that of like, and it's something we've tried to ponder and we're kind of trying to get at, right? That like, and we find a difference by gender. Is it because the only way to get elected to office is to hew to type, to be the kind of person who meets these gender stereotypes? Or does it mean you have to be such a savvy politician that you know to change yourself to meet what the audience expects? Now, if it's that latter one, then we would expect that, as, say, as gender norms are broken, or as you acquire more power and you're more insulated from, right, from electoral pressures, right? Nancy Pelosi is going to get reelected. She doesn't need to worry about what voters think. So then you can change. You can sort of break from that mold. Um, so it's a really interesting and thoughtful way of getting at that question that we may want to look at. I'm, I genuinely, I don't know that I have an expectation. Uh, on the whole, I think you might, if I were to guess, and it would just be a pure guess, I would say they're probably pretty steady across time. Um, but I would be really interested to kind of plot that out because it's a, it, all I'm doing is guessing, honestly. I think that the results could go either way. And I'll just say one of the things that I didn't really get into in the presentation was the the role model effect. Um, we talk about the, the, the sort of... Um, uh, the, as we talked talk about in the literature about the prototype, right, that we, there are now more women in politics than there used to be. Now, it's, I, I, ideally, at some point, right, when there is gender parity, people will no longer immediately conjure uh, a male politician as the, the, the prototype. But um, there's probably less of that effect than there was in the 70s. Um, and so there, 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 some of those pressures may have diminished relative to previous eras. We just still think that they're pretty strong at this point. Okay, well, I'm gonna end the discussion there right now and turn it over to our next presenter. Thank you both, Jared um, and Zachary. Um, our next presentation is by Newly Paul. Dr. Paul is an assistant professor of journalism in the Mayborn School of Journalism at the University of North Texas. Her research interests lie in the areas of political communication and media coverage of minorities. Prior to joining academia, Dr. Paul was a journalist in New Delhi and Los Angeles, where she had a number of beats, ranging from city government to crime to education. Like our other panelists, Dr. Paul has an impressive publication record, and her work has actually been very interdisciplinary in nature, and it's been featured in both communication and political science journals. Uh, this is my cat. She's my co-presenter. I apologize, but she's elderly, and she gets to be a part of this. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Paul. Uh, I look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Carly. I'm going to share my screen.
So I think I'm having the same issue as the previous presenter. Um, it says host disabled participant screen sharing from. Okay, try that now, Nuli. Okay. Did that work? I think so. Thank you for your patience, Dr. Paul. No worries. Okay. So the paper I'm presenting is titled Cracking the Glass Ceiling in the Newsroom, a Historical Examination of Women Journalists' Perspective on Gender in the Media. My paper broadly falls into the, uh, the whole uh, scholarly work that looks into gender in the newsroom and the, the repercussions of that. So this vast body of literature has found that um, gender has an impact both within and outside the newsroom. Uh, we've seen that within the newsroom, gender affects issues like story assignments, newsroom hiring and promotion practices, as well as newsroom management styles and journalists' overall satisfaction with their profession. Outside the newsroom, we see that gendered perceptions can affect how journalists select sources, how they frame the news, as well as how audiences perceive journalists' credibility. Now, the C-SPAN archives offer a really unique way to extend this uh, scholarly work by helping us conduct comparative analyses of women journalists' experience throughout the ages and across various types of media specializations. The archives have um, oral histories that feature women journalists who worked for various um, publications as well as various specializations like politics, sports, photojournalism, et cetera, where they discuss how gender shaped their identities and their professions. Uh, because these are first person experiences, they really help us in creating a holistic account of what journalism is and how it has evolved through the ages. It also helps us to draw connections between the gendered experiences of women and the content they produce. And this helps us better understand how their identities shape their views of the world and um, how it affects their news coverage. So just to talk a little bit about the aim of my study, um, I'm using oral history interviews from, uh, of six women journalists from the C-SPAN archives, and I'm, and I'm conducting a comparative analysis of their experience through the, through the ages. Uh, I'm looking at these particular research questions. I'm looking at how their lived experiences in the newsroom affected their reporting practices. I'm looking at the strategies they used to counter gender-based discrimination within the newsroom and outside the newsroom. I'm looking at whether gendered norms shape their identities as journalists. And I'm also looking at how their perceptions varied depending on the type of journalism they practiced and the era in which they lived. Um, this is just a tabular representation of the journalists who are in my sample. So uh, the I have six journalists in total, like I said earlier, and the first five out of the six of these journalists, that is Ruth Cohen Nash through Eileen Shanahan, their interviews were conducted for the Washington Press Club Foundation as part of their oral history project called Women in Journalism. Uh, and the, the careers of all of these women spanned three specific eras in time. These women worked from 1920s through the World War II. Then we had women who worked from the end of World War II through the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And then the rest of the people uh, in those interviews worked after 1964 when discrimination on the basis of gender and race became illegal. The last person on my um, table here is Diana Walker. And uh, she is her interview is more recent than the others. It was conducted in 2013. And this was conducted by the Briscoe Center for American History at the University of Texas at Austin to mark the occasion of adding her photographs to their archive of photos taken by other nationally acclaimed photojournalists. So in this table, you can see that um, the women who, who have selected for my project, they are from various specializations. They are, I have reporters, I have a sports journalist, I have a copy editor, 
um, and, I, and they also worked at various media organizations. They're mostly well-known national media organizations. And then I had Mary Garber who worked for a local publication in Winston-Salem. Um, you can see that the years they were active, uh, they're, they're kind of pretty spread out through all of the 20th century. And I think that is what adds to the depth of the data and helps me um, get an idea of how their views and their experiences changed over time. Um, I know you wanted to see pictures, so I do have their pictures here. Uh, I wanted to start by giving you a brief history of the eras that these women worked in, because I draw a little bit on how the, the eras looked like in general, in order to understand how the women reacted to their situations. So the first two women I have here are Ruth Cohen Nash and Mary, Gar Mary Garber, and their careers sort of intersected, um, I would say. So these are, this is uh, about women journalists who were working in the period between the 20s and 40s. It's interesting that the women who were working at this time, they really adopted the qualities which were um, traditionally ascribed to men. So uh, qualities like toughness and lack of emotions, um, because these journalists were few in number, there were really few women journalists at the time. So they kind of adopted all of these qualities um, and they really tried hard to navigate the line between traditional notions of femininity and the toughness that was expected of typical reporters. They really uh, tried very hard to continuously prove their excellence and they consciously avoided challenging any sort of gender stereotypes because like I said earlier, there were very few women in the newsroom and they really didn't want to draw attention or upset the tenuous power control that they had in the, in the newsroom. The second era is that um, of Betsy Wade and Dorothy Gilliam. So at the end of World War II, when the men returned home from the war, um, American society was overtaken by a new wave of conservatism. Um, it was interesting because at this time, post-war messages of women's emp empowerment um, coexisted with messages saying that the rightful place of women um, was in the home. And the effects of this overall conservatism was felt within newsrooms as well. Uh, which had hired all of these women staffers to replace the men who had been drafted for the war. And now that they were coming back, the newsrooms sort of reassigned these women, giving them smaller roles and less important roles. So they were uh, expected to report for the women's sections of the newspapers or to write for women's weekly magazines, which were not considered as prestigious as the general news assignments, which had a wider readership and a wider audience. Um, newsrooms were run mostly by male editors, and they were pretty hesitant to hire women for more prestigious general reporting assignments. And uh, with reference to broadcast news, though there were women working in broadcast, um, there, were, there were very few women who were featured on air, um, and women's salaries, of course, were far below that of their male counterparts. The last era I have in my sample uh, they are signified by Eileen Shanahan and, Di and Diana Walker. Uh, so this is the period um, in the 70s and 80s where equal rights legislations derived from the civil rights movement and the attention garnered from the second wave of the women's rights movement made a change in the attitude and the kind of power that women had in the newsroom. So um, the, the senior women journalists, as well as women who were editors, photographers, etc., in the newsrooms, they were agitating actively for equal pay, and they were willing to file lawsuits in order to be treated equally. Uh, this period was marked by a huge change in the news agenda. The agenda became highly diversified and there were black women who were being featured in mainstream women's magazines. Uh, women were being hired as anchors for TV shows and feminist issues like abortion was receiving in-depth coverage in the news. So um, I also want to tie some of these historical trends to media theory as a whole. And like I said earlier, um, talking about gender in the newsroom, I said that women and men as journalists tend to differ in terms of their newsroom experiences and how they cover the news. So um, women tend to cite more women's sources than men. They use 
fewer stereotypes in their content. They tend to emphasize personalization and they tend to frame stories more positively than male reporters. So that is one um, type of studies. We also have other studies that find conflicting information. They find that there aren't really any significant, statistically significant differences between how women and men um, act as journalists. And they find that external factors like social cultural values, the size of the media organization, the ownership of the media organization. So these kinds of external factors sort of wash out any of the gender differences that might be there. Um, so in order to explain these discrepancies in the findings and the, the inconsistent findings in the literature, two models of socialization have often been used, and that's the gender model and the job model. Um, the gender model uh, like our earlier speaker was saying, the gender model is, uh, it, it kind of um, draws from the stereotypic roles that men and women have traditionally played in society. And this says that men and women tend to socialize differently into professional spaces because they inherently share different values and priorities, again, because of the roles that they have played traditionally in society. In contrast to this is the job model, which says that regardless of how somebody has been socialized, men and women will behave similarly if their experiences in the workplace are similar. So uh, when we apply all of this to journalism, it means that if women are working in newsrooms where masculine behaviors are promoted and rewarded, they are likely to adopt those behaviors. Uh, but if we see a newsroom where there are more women or, mi or minorities in um, positions of power, maybe some of those expectations could change. So um, to tie all of that to the data and to kind of see the broad themes that I found, the first thing I wanna talk about is how the women in the, in the data set talked about their initiation into the profession. So almost all of the journalists that I listened to in, in, my, uh, in, the, in the oral history interviews, they all described working in an overwhelmingly masculine culture. They described their initial years to be filled with struggles where they worked long hours for low or no pay. And their, their entire aim during this time was to work really hard and establish their journalistic credentials so they could be taken seriously by their male colleagues and their male editors. One example was Betsy Wade, who became the first female copy editor at the Times. Um, she was among the top 10 women in her class of 60 at Columbia, but she got rejected when she first applied to the Times. Um, in her interview, she describes her newsroom being openly hostile to her. And she also realized that there were double standards in how men and women were being paid. She found that even though women journalists were doing a lot of the work that the male editors were doing, um, they, they did not get the title of the editor. Um, they were called, they got the title of researchers where the pay was extremely low compared to what the male editors were, were getting. Uh, and once again, they were doing the same work or maybe even more. Um, Dorothy Gilliam, she was the only black woman in my sample and her interview was extremely fascinating because um, I found that she described a lot of additional barriers that she faced as a black woman for getting into the profession. Um, she said that she had uh, a lot of journalism experience because she had started out as working at a, at a black woman's magazine. But when she tried to leverage that experience and try to get a job at a mainstream uh, publication, she was rejected immediately because nobody would take those credentials as, uh, as legitimate. So then she decided to enroll at Columbia in order to be accepted by mainstream uh, reporters and mainstream journalism. And she described her um, experience at Columbia as very traumatic because she never really fit in with the rest of the classmates and the culture there was, was very different. But she uh, was so much in love with journalism and the profession that she was willing to jump through all of those hoops in order to um, establish legitimacy for herself. So again, overall, the women described a very uh, difficult introduction into the profession. Um, the next theme that I uh, want to talk about is how the women navigated the masculine culture of the newsroom. And uh, the literature shows that there are three main strategies that women tend to employ to navigate a gendered workplace. And uh, they, they try to incorporate, so they want to become one of the boys, which requires women to take on the so-called masculine values and uh, 
reporting behaviors, um, or some of them would use uh, feminist behaviors where they will make a conscious decision to provide an alternative voice or they um, display retreat behaviors where they just say enough is enough, we are out, and they leave the profession, they go work as freelancers rather than continuing to stay in the profession and fight back in the workplace. So um, in my uh, data set, I found that the journalists talked about several different types of these behaviors, combinations of these behaviors in order to deal with the masculine culture of the newsroom. And I interestingly found that the behaviors uh, vary depending on which era the journalist was living in and also the nature of the media organization. So the women who were working in the early decades of the 20th century, they were more likely to adopt the masculine norms unquestioningly and to try and act as one of the boys in order to fit in. But in the later parts of the century, the women who worked in larger and urban newsrooms in the mid and later decades of the century, they were more likely to exhibit um, either feminist behaviors or a mix of feminist and retreat behaviors. Um, and then there were women who wanted to have their professional lives as well as the family life. They were most likely to exhibit retreat behaviors as were senior journalists who had spent their entire careers protesting benevolent sexism and outright hostility from colleagues, and they had only seen very small changes in the profession. So they were most likely to say, well, I'm out and I'm not going to fight this from within the profession. Um, I also found some other tactics that women used. Um, I found that some of them said, well, since we are very small in number in the newsroom, we're just going to be quiet and not make too many waves. We are just going to try our best to get along with colleagues. There were others who just completely ignored um, the hostile work environment. So they felt that their best bet was to continue working hard um, or to use a sense of humor or to just not react to all of these humiliations. Um, there were some other women, mostly in the 60s and 70s, who um, fought the system by building allies among men and, and persisting despite the odds that they came up. So I want to play a clip of Mary Garber, uh, where she talks about her frustration with how the profession treats women um, and how and what she thinks of it. So. But be told no. And one of the big problems that young women face today is, for some reason, which I do not understand, the male sports writers blame the women for all the problems. The clip, newly. When, uh, oh. I'm sorry. This has happened to me before. Sorry about that. I think you have to switch the screen. School closes the locker room to keep from admitting women instead of. I think you'll have to unshare your screen and then reshare it on the internet. Oh, Oops. Can you see it now? No. no. Oh. Hmm. There you go. Okay, perfect, thank you. And one of the big problems that young women face today is, for some reason, which I do not understand, the male sports writers blame the women for all the problems. <laughs> when uh, a school closes the locker room to keep from admitting women, instead of saying, hey, these people are trying to keep me from doing my job, they say, well, that's all Diane's fault because she wanted to go into the dressing room. It's not Diane's fault. It's not Lisa's fault. It's not my fault. All we're doing is trying to do our job. And uh, I can't understand why the men don't realize this and why aren't they, they aren't as willing to uh, fight for our rights as they are for their own rights. But that isn't the way it works. And they don't seem to realize that if I lose my rights, then they're going to lose theirs too. Okay, so um, I just found her to be very fascinating in how she um, 
well, Mary Garber, when she started out as a journalist, she was the one who said that, you know, I just ignore uh, these kinds of insults and I take it with a with a pinch of salt or I, I just uh, use my sense of humor. But toward the end of her career, you can see the frustration because she's been through so much and she feels that even then, um, this interview was conducted in the mid 90s. So at that point, she felt that there hadn't been enough acceptance and there was um, there was more that could be done so that women could uh, could be accepted as sports writers in the newsroom. Um, the last theme I want to talk about is how gender shapes reporting assignments and newsroom interactions. So uh, several women that I uh, that were interviewed in these archives, they described a range of direct and indirect impacts of gender on their profession in terms of the content they used as well as the assignments that they received. So Mary Garber, whom we were listening to right now, she said that she was so extremely grateful to her editor for just hiring her as a sports writer and uh, sort of dealing with the insults from other people that she developed a reputation for always saying good things about her sources and never being too critical because she was afraid that um, if, if people complained too much, then she would face the repercussions and the little bit of tenuous hold on power that she had, she would lose that as well. Um, Another example was Ruth Cohen Nash, who was covering the World War II, and her editors had sent her overseas with the express direction to only cover war stories from a woman's angle. And so she stuck to covering stories about nurses, hospital, food, and civilian issues, even though she had access to these fabulous stories about strategies and um, other, other things that she could have written about. But in her interview, she says that since she was given this express um, directive to just cover war stories from a woman's angle, it kind of limited her in terms of where she could go and who would talk to her. So those kinds of things. And then Dorothy Gilliam, of course, um, her interview was especially interesting because she talked about the intersectional, um, how race and gender intersected to affect her experiences in the newsroom. And one thing she, she said is that she, when she would interview black politicians in her initial days as a reporter, just because of the racial affinity, they expected her to treat them, uh, to give them an easy time and not ask difficult questions, which she found um, difficult because she was a, a solid journalist and a solid reporter and she didn't want to uh, just let them off easy without asking those hard questions. Um, and she was also talking about how she would often get stereotyped into always being asked to cover stories on poverty or welfare or other so-called racialized issues. And she felt that this wasn't um, how she wanted to, uh, wanted to see her career progress. Um, in conclusion, my findings show that uh, the job model of socialization is, is very impactful and that really shaped women journalists identities and careers. Uh, I also found that women's lived experiences in the newsroom affected the types of stories that they produced. The masculine culture of the newsroom in which they were socialized, it really left very little room for them to question the norms. But despite that, the women succeeded in diversifying the news agenda in incorporating marginalized voices and promoting issues that were traditionally not considered newsworthy. And in doing this, the women were able to change the norms of journalism. Uh, women, women's perception of gender roles and the strategies they used to counter gender discrimination were also influenced to a great deal, um, depending on which era they lived and what kind of sociocultural forces were in play at the time. Uh, one limitation of my study, I mean, it, it has many limitations, but one major limitation is that the, the sample is quite, um, it, it, it's not very diverse, that there is only black, one Black woman who is available, whose interview is available. I think if we have more diverse voices in the oral histories um, at C-SPAN, we will be able to ask more questions that will help us understand the intersectional nature of women journalist experiences in the newsroom, and that will give us a, a a better picture of how journalism has evolved over the years. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paul. Questions? Well, one thing that came to my mind as I was reading the paper and listening to your presentation is um, maybe this could be the same, a very similar story for academia. Um, and <laughs> um, 
you know, this timeline might be mapping on here. Um, and I, I wonder in your paper, if you could, one way you could actually like strengthen your paper a little bit is to tap into how this more broadly has been the trajectory of women. Um, and, but this paper is, is important in that framework because I mean, the media is, and, and, and reporting is critical to democracy, right? And so the stories that are told are become the narratives that people have in their brain. It's what's salient, right? It impacts what they know about the world that they live in, right? We're seeing fake news right now, mm -hmm. um, right? And so I think that you could relate this a little bit bigger picture um, mm -hmm. because, you know, having, um, you know, cis white male um, narratives, right, and, and their perspective, for the length of our democracy has not been beneficial, right, and the experiences of women trying to break in to tell different stories, or to, to even be able to have the same opportunities and not simply be grateful for the crumbs that they're thrown, right, um, has impacts the public's perspective of not just women, but also the experiences and lives and what's happening in the U.S. and abroad. Mm -hmm. So I would just encourage you to kind of, you know, tap into that more broadly, because I think you have a really good component here that would fit in with that. Thank you. I agree with that. Jared, do you have a question for me? Sorry, jump yeah. right in, Jared. I'm yeah, sorry. sorry. Um, I, I just had a, a one. I, I, I thought the, the idea of uh, or, or the concept of credentials was something that struck me as very interesting in this story that I wanted to know more about. Um, that it seemed like in all of these cases, I mean, these women were qualified, generally overqualified for the jobs that they had. Um, mm -hmm. And that I, I'm kind of wondering, you know, the, the the sort of pathway through which they even broke into this to begin with. I, I was really struck. I think I wrote a note. Um, it was in the discussion of Dorothy Gilliam that, oh, she wasn't getting the jobs that she was qualified for. So she decided to enroll at Columbia. I was thinking, is that an easy thing to do? Um, uh, I was just wondering how, I don't know if you have, if, if this is information that you have available, it may be more difficult, but I, I did want to ask just about sort of like the pathway to breaking into these careers, even to begin with, given the barriers that existed to success. Uh, it was very interesting because most of the women who uh, worked in the larger national papers, they had lots and lots, like decades of experience working in smaller papers before they were tapped to um, go to the larger papers and that too, because they had uh, connections or they knew people who sort of recommended them to the senior editors and said, maybe you should take a look at this person. She has um, these many years of experience and she has done really well. So it was just, it was just through recommendations and because they did such good work. Uh, Mary Garber, she's the one who worked as a sports writer in the in, beginning in the forties. She was extremely persistent and that's common with most of these women, they just kept um, going up to their editors and saying, hey, do you have a story for me that you would want me to do a political story or say this general news assignment, send me there, I know the source, I can do a good job. So they were incredibly persistent and constantly um, just asking for bigger assignments for, for more work to do. Um, the photojournalist in my sample, Diana Walker, she was working for Peanuts just because the publication was giving her credentials to shoot on Capitol Hill. And she was doing that just because I think they were paying her $25 or something really low for her pictures, but she was simply doing that so she would get known and she would have a portfolio that she could then leverage to get a better job but but most of these women um they kind of just fought their way through or sort of relied on allies uh, that they built within the profession to even get a toehold but the journalism school approach was interesting because Dorothy Gilliam she saw that people were kind of getting hired out of Columbia. That was a, a pipeline that was feeding into the major news organization. So um, she didn't talk in her interview about how she got accepted into the school. I can't imagine that was easy, but um, she did talk about her experiences there being very traumatic because um, the classmates who came in already had um, experience working as an editor and there were other people who had traveled significantly and she didn't really have those kinds of exposures so she felt that she didn't really fit in but she um, 
she really loved the profession. She, so she kind of stayed on. But you're right in noticing that as a huge barrier. I guess the way the profession has been constructed from the very beginning is that it's it's very elite, very masculine. It's it's meant for a highly educated upper class. So some of those biases still still exist till today. It's really interesting. Thank you. All right, Allison. Thank you for your, your really awesome paper. Um, one of the things I was wondering about was sort of the correlation between different like waves of feminism and the same um, sort of way that you divided up those three different eras at the beginning. And it seemed like from the quotes that you shared with us that there's a lot of um, sort of different wave um, discourses that are invoked in what they're saying. So like the idea of equality versus equity um, sort of appearing in, in two different um, transcripts that you were telling. And I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit or tell us if you saw any of those other um, sort of like more feminist discourses appearing based on when the, the women were working. I saw a very clear feminist discourse in Eileen Shanahan's interview and Betsy Wade's interview. They were two of the women who were very involved. And Eileen Shanahan is not surprising because she was one of the people who was involved in the lawsuits uh, at the times where the women um, went on strike to protest the, uh, the wage discrepancy and the, the, the unequal treatment that they were getting. So I'm not surprised at that. And she was also one of the women who did decided to leave the profession in the end because she just didn't find enough fulfillment. So um, there was a stark um, difference in the way that the women in the who were working in the 40s, the, the 20s, 40s, 50s, how they spoke about the, prof the profession and just being grateful to be allowed to work and to be given these opportunities versus the others who were really angry and they just, they, they couldn't fathom that they had put in so many years and so much effort only to be treated um, in, in, in very um, different ways from their male colleagues. So there was a, a very different um, way of talking. You're right about that. Zachary? Hi. Uh, so I love the paper. I also, this is a separate thing, but I would like to ask if you wouldn't mind if I kind of give it to some of my undergrads as an example of how to do really good qualitative research. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, if it's not published, I want to ask permission before I do that. Um, so what I was really interested in is there's an element to what you're finding that is a story about institutional change, which is really interesting to me as a like student of American political institutions, because institutions are usually loath to change and they don't change because you like ask nicely. So that's what I find really interesting here is like, is it what, what do you think like cause any sort of change within the institution, right? Like, if, I mean, you look at the ethnographic studies of like newsrooms like Gans and Tuckman in the 70s, they're saying news works this way. And then you get to Nikki Usher in this decade and she's like, yeah, that's still the case. So if there is change, is there something about like the, the political or social context that is going on that's, uh, that's sort of get, investing the people asking for change with more influence among those who are capable of giving it to them? Uh, part of it is probably the business aspect of it. Part of it is just our society changing. So uh, audience tastes are changing. Um, I do related work on uh, newsroom demographics and we look at, um, we did a uh, sort of experiments and surveys to see how um, minorities and women in the, in, the, in the newsroom, how their impact um, to bring about any sort of change within the newsroom, how that depends on audience demographics. And we often find that in areas where the, where the newsroom is catering to a minority heavy demographic, minorities within the, gen, within the newsroom tend to have more power to uh, cover events differently. So um, there's a lot of, it's, there isn't ever a linear, um, how, how should I say, not a, not a linear impact of newsroom composition on the kind of content that's produced. It's a whole, it's a very complex reaction. So it depends on ownership whether it's a private or a public ownership, it depends on who the audience is that they're catering to. It depends on how many women and minorities are working within the newsroom. So it's, it kind of depends on all of these factors. And I think the, the reason that our newsrooms have changed somewhat is because of all of these factors, um, who the audience is has changed, what they want has changed, uh, business values have changed, um, our society's values have changed. So I think, um, it's a combination of all of these factors that have caused um, 
the, the way that news is produced to be changed. 